I lived in a hotel over by the Dam Square, um, and it was full of prostitutes. That's what I remember about it. And I remember I was a fundamentalist Christian uh, coming out of uh, a, a psychological breakdown. So it was an interesting place. Like I felt like the universe guided me there to, to break down my defenses about um, my Calvinist ideas, because these, these ladies were people just like any other people. I would walk out each day, and there was a prostitute that would stand outside of the hotel, and each day she would look at me, and, and she would say, why not? <laughs> she knew I was American. And uh, it was a good question. It's a good question to ask yourself just in general, not specifically in relation to a, a woman dressed in a miniskirt with a rabbit skin fur coat on. Um, <laughs> uh, I never had an answer for her, and, and it was a question I carried with me as I walked through the streets of Amsterdam, and that, that's all I did. I was a ghost. I'd walk through the streets at, late at night, and in the daytime I was having psychological problems. And every once in a while, Peck and Kloppenberg would give me a, an ad, and I would smile and be the, the happy man, and then I would go back and, and sit in various hotels and rooms and you know quietly try to figure out why I was uh, struggling with mental illness. It was interesting. I was lost, and... Um, I was walking through the streets one day, and there was outside an old one of those old brown bars. There was a a mirror about this big that had been smashed into pieces, and it seemed really important. Someone there was, someone was throwing it away, and it had etchings on it of angels and all these things and cupids, and it seemed wrong that it would go away. Um, so I took it home and and laid all the pieces on the floor. And every day I would spend hours trying to find a way to to put the glass back together again. And it was only after maybe a week of doing this that I realized the whole time I'm just looking at a fractured vision of myself. Uh, and then I threw the mirror away <laughs> because the message had been delivered. The message was there. You are trying to put yourself back together again. Uh, and, and as I say, Amsterdam was a good place to do that. I got just enough work to where I could live and make money and everybody left me alone. Um, which I needed at that point. I have a history of mental illness in my family, um, a lot of bipolar uh, behavior, a lot of borderline personality disorder, so I have it genetically. Um, and then to complicate matters, when I was about 12, I started doing a lot of drugs. Um, and by 14, I was in danger of dying from, from drugs. And I decided to become... Um, I asked Jesus to save me from it, <laughs> and and um, I went to churches and kneeled and prayed and um, you know you've probably seen pictures of Southern people speaking in tongues and I went to those churches and and tried to be healed and um, I always told myself yes you're being healed but I never felt healed. I was brought there as a child in in the South and it was. It's like a TV show. It was very strange. The South was, I couldn't understand it. I was maybe five years old when I was brought there. Um, but I liked going to, to church with the, the real fundamentalist people because I had a very uh, uh, Presbyterian-style family. They were very reserved and quiet. And in these churches, this very quiet country man would walk into the church, and a minute later he'd be screaming and going crazy and jumping around. And that seemed important. Um, something was trapped in me, and it wanted to leap up and jump around. So I jumped around with the Jesus hat on. And uh, after a while, I realized this Jesus hat doesn't fit, but it sure felt good jumping around. Maybe I should take the hat off and jump around anyway. Uh, and that's what I did. I, you know, I did a lot of things that didn't make a lot of sense, like becoming a model. I, you know, last thing in the world I'd ever thought about was being a model. But it it... it, it I knew that the things that I chose purposefully ended up making me crazy, so I thought maybe if I chose something by accident, that that would give the universe a chance to do its work on me. Yes, by thinking, why not? Yeah, 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 why not? Uh, an important message from that lady. I lived on the Leinbanskrak, um in 1981 and 82 and 83, so um, those famous venues, the Milkweg and Paradiso, Nick Cave was playing there and all those people, and I was a ghost. So I, I, I never thought to go anywhere or do anything. I just walked past and I saw something happening. Um, and I, I saw a record store somewhere around there, 
I was going back to America to visit a friend who had always been kind to me and helped me. He lived in New York, and I knew that he loved uh, music. So I went in the record store and asked him, what's, what's a really interesting record for uh, someone who really likes music? I knew nothing about music. I only knew about Christian music, which is pretty boring. Um, and, and so the guy uh, held up uh, Tom Waits' record and said, uh, Swordfish Trombone, so it's just a breakout record and said, uh, you should get him this. So I said, okay, I didn't think about it. I just thought, well, it looks like that guy's friends with a midget, because that's what's on the cover. And uh, I, t I took it to, to my friend, and we put it on his record player. And um, he was very conventional, so he liked Jackson Brown and you know, con straight up kind of American bands, Bruce Springsteen and things like that. And he listened to the first few notes and said, oh my God, this is awful. This man sounds like a wino, like he's just a drunk or a homeless man or something. And, uh, and I said, yes, it's terrible. Give it back to me. I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll refund it for another one. <laughs> and I took that record home and I listened to it until there was no grooves on it anymore because I had found a voice howling from a direction which I knew I needed to go, but I saw no way to get there. Uh, so he was John the Baptist in the desert crying out, and uh, I started aiming myself uh, in the direction of Tom Waits. Um, and it, it's interesting how it works, because five years later I was working in a restaurant in New York City. By then I was out of modeling. I had gone through big, big problems, nearly homeless in New York City, which is not a good place to be homeless. And I found this job at a restaurant. In came Tom Waits. Um, and he's standing there, and it's, they served quiche at this restaurant. And I thought, God damn it, if he orders quiche, I'm never going to be able to listen to another one of his records. <laughs> no, no, no. So I was really afraid. And he was staring at the menu real hard. You know, like, he looked right, but he was staring at a menu with quiche on it. And I thought, what is he thinking, man? What is he thinking? And uh, so finally, I said in, in the best Tom White's voice I could muster, What do you have, Mac? And uh, he looked at me and... He said, nothing. And he turned around and walked out, which, uh, the relief. And then he walked across the street. There was a homeless man named Hank who lived in the doorway across the street. This is down in um, Soho. You know, back then it was a little rough. This was when Soho was just starting to be safe. The man's name was Hank, and he thought he was the illegitimate son of Hank Williams. He thought he had been commissioned by the post office to create tiny postage stamp versions of paintings by Bruegel, you know, the, the, the terrible paintings of hell. Um, and, or is it Bruegel? One of those, one of those crazy painters who painted hell. Well, Hieronym Spasch. Yeah, he, he, would, he would talk to me a lot about how he was working on his postage stamps, paintings of Bosch, and, and he lived in hell. He, he ate uh, pepper, black pepper, and drank Listerine, and that's all he ate. He had a guitar with one string on it, and he would make these grunting sounds as people walked by, he, he, like a street performer. And nobody ever did, nobody ever paid any attention to him. Everybody looked away. But Tom Waits walked straight up to him and sat down next to him and talked to him for an hour. And he had a notebook out the whole time writing all of the things that Hank was telling him. And I'm sure they ended up in a Tom Waits song somewhere. And so I had a cue. I went and bought a notebook. And I went and talked to Hank and wrote everything down, and then I started writing in notebooks, and that's really where a lot of my lyrics come from. That, that just that idea, I, I always thought I had to make it up out of my head. And I thought, if Tom Waits has taken notes, I better take notes. The final Tom Waits installment comes when maybe uh, t uh, 20 years later, 20 years later? 20 years later, wow. Um, I'm making a record with Joe Henry, uh, who is a you know Grammy-winning producer, and um, I, I want Tom Waits' saxophone player to play on the record. Ralph Carney is his name. He's really talented. He plays a hundred different instruments, and so Joe says, "Okay, I'll, I'll call Tom and get some advice about how to get the best performance out of Ralph." And I'm like, "I'm operating in this world where people are calling Tom on my behalf. This is this is beautiful." So Joe calls him, and they're talking. And at the end of the conversation, uh, Tom Waits says to Joe, So, who's the artist that's getting the record made? And Joe Henry says, It's a guy named Jim White. Tom Waits says, Oh, yeah, 
the Jesus guy. Because my first record was called Wrong Eye Jesus. And Joe hung up the phone, called me, and said, to Tom Waits, you're the Jesus guy. And I said, please come over here, dig a grave in my backyard, lay me in it, and throw the dirt on me. You will not ever see the smile disappear from my face. I can go to my grave happy now. That's an accomplishment. <laughs> when I was living in Amsterdam, it was a very vital music scene. The English New Romantic scene was going on, and then the American um, weird indie scene was, was happening. And um, I was passing by, um, it must have been Paradiso again. It was in that area, and there was a video playing in a window. This was when music videos were just starting. And it was this guy who kind of looked like me, and he was moving in this way that kind of looked like the way that I moved. And So it's like seeing a mirror image of yourself only functioning on a much higher level. So I saw this man in the window, and I couldn't hear the music. I could just see him doing this and doing this, and it all made perfect sense, and I was just hypnotized. And finally I thought, before that video goes off, I have to run in and, and hear what this music is. And so I ran in, and just as the song was ending, and I could hear it was something about burning a house down. And I thought, yes, I am burning my house down. This man is burning his house down. We have something in common. I, need, I was desperate to find someone to help me fight my way out of where I was. And so Tom Waits made sense, and that guy made sense. So I went to the same record store, and I said, I saw this video of this strange guy, and he was doing this, and he was burning down a house. Do you have that? And he said, yeah, that's David Byrne. And I said, okay, that's, no, it's Talking Heads. And uh, so, same thing with the, with the Tom Waits record, Talking Heads. I listened to it until it didn't work anymore. The, I, there's a, I wrote a story about this. It's called Super White. And it won a big literary prize, which I was bewildered about. It's called the Pushcart Prize. And I don't, I don't want to spoil the story for people. Um, but I'll say that... Uh, I, I sort of had a, a vision that somehow I would have to talk to him about this issue, that, I, that this image that I had in my mind. And most people who have that type of idea are schizophrenics. <laughs> so I was like, this might be a schizophrenic idea, this might not be a schizophrenic idea. Um, but eventually, uh, he ended up walking right in front of my taxi. I was a taxi driver in New York. So I started shouting the word at him that I had had in the vision. It was super, super white. Um, in in um, I can't. It may be young. This there's this continuum of being, and and if you can, uh, if you become so completely what you are, you become the opposite of it. And you know, David Byrne. When I was trying to figure out, because I was very white, um, and I wanted to be cool, like John Coltrane or Don Cherry or someone like that. I wanted to have that sort of innate rhythm and natural quality. But I realized that if I tried to act like them, I would just become more pathetically white. Um, so it occurred to me that maybe I needed to, to just go in the other direction and become even more white. And then and I explained this to someone, and it was a, it was a black lady that I was explaining it to. And uh, she was kind of like, uh, <laughs> and finally she said, oh yeah, so you're trying to become super white. When I explained this theory to her that I had, she was a writer, she's a very smart lady. And when she said super white, I saw the, the video in my mind of this guy and thought, yeah, it's David Byrne, he's super white. If I ever meet him, I will just say the word super white to him and he will understand. Well, there he was walking in front of my taxi and um, so I rolled down the window and stalked him for about two or three blocks, just kind of seeing what he was like. He had on a, a coonskin cap with a little tail and mirror sunglasses and a strange Western outfit. This was down, right down by the restaurant that I worked at 20 years earlier, 15 years earlier. Everything is intertangled. And finally, I, I, I shouted super white at him, just at his back. And he didn't hear, so I shouted louder. And, and he, he seemed like he might have heard, and he just started walking a little faster. And I started shouting louder and louder and louder and louder, chasing him, shouting super white, super white, super white, super white, hanging my head out the window of the cab. And finally, he ran into a store, and I remember him peeking out the window at me <laughs> in my taxi. And I was so disappointed. 
Why did I get this message from the universe to sh shout super wide at him? It didn't, it didn't make any sense. I was so disappointed. And I thought, maybe I'm reading everything wrong. Maybe I'm crazy. Um, I drove away real sad. And, and, and five years later, he's shaking my hand in his record label saying, I think you're an amazing songwriter. It's such an honor to meet you. Not knowing that I'm the same guy that shouted, <laughs> shouted crazy words at him years earlier. And, you know, the way that he found out about me, it's, that's, that's an hour story by itself. It's, it's a series of extraordinarily improbable events. My sister's a lawyer, and um, I never told her any of the mental struggles I had because I didn't want her to worry about me. Um, but when I got the record deal offer, um, I called her and said, I have some things to tell you here. Um, and I told her the whole story about all of these things, I mean, they, you, you've heard one-tenth of, no, one-hundredth of the story. Um, there, there were coincidences that are unreal. And I, so I told her the whole story, and she listened very quietly. She's a lawyer, very sane. And at the end of it, she said, you will say nothing of this to anyone at the record label until the contract is signed. And it was so cool because I was kind of going crazy. I was kind of thinking, this is all too weird and too weird and too weird. And when she said that, I thought, yes, it's just a business deal, isn't it? It was like I suddenly gave my, myself permission to be calm and sane. And sometimes, if you're lucky, if you're suffering from mental illnesses and it's not too extreme, you can just find a way to give yourself permission to be sane. Some, some people can't. They have chemical imbalances. My problem was related to consciousness and thought. I gave myself permission to calm down and it became a kind of a quiet joke to me. It's like, hmm, when will I tell David about Super White? <laughs> and when I did, he was so cool about it. He was just like, oh yeah, that makes sense. And it's like, well, it doesn't scare you that I stalked you and all this. And he said, oh no, lots of people do that. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> He's a wonderful person. He's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful person. The way my mind works, I. I'm like a little child. Uh, I don't. I don't. Um, f f I don't follow an interest as an adult would. When when the record wore out, I never thought about David Byrd again. When the Tom Waits record wore out, I never thought about Tom Waits again until they re reappeared in my life. It was like the seed had been planted, and I didn't have to think about it anymore. I, I'm not really searching for them because I think when you search, you know about Heisinger's principle of uncertainty. It says. The basic idea is that observation changes behavior, and intense observation intensely changes behavior. Um, I was so intensely looking for help that help could never find me. So I, I wasn't looking for music to save me. Music found me. The, the universe sent it to me, I believe. Um, you, can, you can call that whatever you want to call that. Um, uh, there's, there's an order beneath reality which is beautiful and elaborate and we catch little glimpses of it from time to time um, it happens to me a lot we, we call you know young called it synchronicity it happens to some people more than others um, and I think it has to some degree it has to do with just how desperate you are to be free of yourself um, I was desperate to be free so there came Tom Waits into my life over and over again there came David Byrne into my life over and over again um, the, the amount of coincidence that occurred uh, is, is, you can't just say it's random. You have to say there is order there. What problems do is you, um, you find a way to solve the problem and they run around the corner and they put on a costume and then they come back. <laughs> and you say, don't I know you? And they say, no, you don't know us. And you say, but, 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 but. And then you go around and around with them. And then finally you realize they're the same problems. And you send them and then around the corner they come in a different costume, a more elaborate costume. Eventually you start to catch on. This, this is the same problem returning in many forms. So um, if I say, yes, I solved my problems, that's a costume for them to wear. They will come back. So no, I didn't solve my problems. Uh, kids saved my life. Um, I talked earlier about giving yourself permission. I never gave myself permission to be sane um, until I had a child, and I didn't want that child to be crazy. Um, so when my first kid came, I thought, I have to find a way to teach my child to live in their skin. 
Um, and my first child, it was, it was very challenging because um, her mother, I think, is mentally ill. And so two mentally ill people raising a child doesn't give the child much of a chance. Um, she's doing good. She went through very, very, very hard times. And helping her through those hard times made me grow as a person. I used to tell this story about the, the parking place. I lived, I lived, imagine I live in a house out in the middle of nowhere, and I, I, I need love badly. And I've created a parking place for love to come pulling in. But it's very, very narrow. And any car that comes to pull in, offering love, can't fit. And it crushes the flower beds, and then I run out and I start screaming at, at the cars, you get out of here, you're the wrong car. They, they smash into the wall, or they knock the flower pots over, or they, 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 they make a mess. Um, my parking space for love was so small. Um, when a child came, it fit perfectly. And as then the second child came, and the parking space got bigger. And now it's, it's a big enough parking space for real love, you know, e expansive love, to, um, to, to blossom in my life. I'm 60, I'm ready, I'm ready for love. <laughs> um, but let me tell you, in, in terms of that, when you feel ready for love, it's important to give back. I was gonna tell you about my shirt. Um, can I tell you about that? Um, at, at seeing children made me aware that we, my children are so lucky, even it, with the struggles that they've had. I think about kids in third world countries, and the struggles that they have just living. So at the end of, of every show that I've done so far, uh, for many years, I auction my shirt off at the end of the night. These are vintage Western shirts from the U.S. I'm out of them now. I don't have any more. But uh, I sold all of them in the U.K. Um, but every year, through fans buying shirts from me, I call it the shirt off my back campaign, every year I raise about $1,000 for Doctors Without Borders. I, I donate to Medicine Sans Frontiers, I think it's also known as here. And they think I'm like some kind of millionaire or something because I keep sending them huge, huge amounts of money. It comes from my fans who at the end of the night, I tell stories all night about my children, about finding my way. And then I say, let's help somebody else who wants to buy this shirt. Two nights ago in London, I sold my shirt, my jacket, and a second jacket that I had. And we raised 370 pounds in one night. <laughs> Um, and I, 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 I think, okay, maybe I've been a musician for a long time. Maybe I should start that as a nonprofit. I should start that. Because if you can imagine, me, uh, I'm, I'm not well known. Can you imagine if David Byrne auctioned his shirt off at the end of a concert? Can you imagine if there was an online app to where you could bid on it and you could see what the bid was during a concert? So that may be the next, next thing that I take on some sort of philanthropy work to give back. At a certain point, you have to start giving back. I don't consider my music necessarily giving back. I, I want something, something more direct to give back. <laughs>